Hey, it's Metal Dave here along with my co-host Jason McMaster, and welcome to the Texas Blizzard episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Man, it has been a crazy week here in Texas. If you live in the state, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've been watching the news elsewhere around the world, you know what I'm talking about. We are in the midst of hopefully toward the tail end of what is an historical snow and ice weather pattern here in Texas. Um, we've had more snow in one night uh, than we had in 72 years uh, one night last week. And we've had blackouts. We've had water shortages. We've had roads that are impassable. Uh, I've got no running water at my house currently for the third day in a row. Uh, which is why I'm looking a little rough today. <laughs> it's you just look the, been... you look exactly the same to me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I don't know what that says about the way I look the other days. Then. <laughs> yeah, you might be. It's it's all a frame of mind. I think. Yeah. Well, it's been crazy. I'll say that. Uh, let's we tell have... them what we're gonna before we get further in the weather. Let's tell them what our episode is about today, just real quick. Oh, well, yeah, we're going to get into um, underrated albums, and uh, we'll explain more about that later because there is a little asterisk next to uh, that that topic title. So um, stay tuned for that. But uh, yeah, by, by this time, they know we're going to totally nerd and geek on all the things that are winged with that title. Yeah, um, exactly. The things that are happening that to you are happening to pretty much everyone. Uh, no water, no heat, no power. Um, luckily, the power has been restored uh, for the most part. There's still yeah. some people without power. Uh, Red Cross and FEMA and, uh, you know, n not to get weird on you, but, uh, you know, Ted Cruz went to Mexico, thought he could escape it for a second, and then he <laughs> felt bad and turned around and came back because yeah. he was getting bad press over it. And uh, that's that's I thought that was pretty funny, actually. Yeah. That he's back and he should be trying at least tr showing that he's trying to make some decisions to uh, warm up Texas. That's yeah. What yeah. Yeah. Funny and maddening all at the same time, to be perfectly honest. But, uh, yeah, uh, my parents live in San Antonio. They've been out, out of power for multiple days, no electricity. Uh, my power has been restored. Uh, thankfully, all things considered, uh, my house has done better than most. We've been on and off without power, but the power has been mostly on, more so than off. Um, but now we're dealing with uh, no water for day three. So we're boiling snow uh, so we can flush toilets and brush teeth and drink water. And uh, I never thought I'd say as a as a native Texan that one day I would be boiling snow in order to get a drink of water. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> and we're also probably two months away from a four month long heat wave. So just crazy weather lately. Yeah. Texas is not known for its seasons because it's normal for it to be between 80 and a hundred degrees all the time. Right. Yeah. Right yeah. Um, the, the fact that, you know, it's bad uh, when there's a, a cold snap like this, this is kind of beyond cold snap. This is like a cold quake. Um, <laughs> yeah. We I like that. We made headline news globally, um, and y you know when uh, John Bush calls you and says, "Dude, you doing all right down there?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. He was worried enough to you know to get a hold of me and. Um, you know, it, it's been a while since we've spoke. And so, you know, he, he was, he's worried about, you know, it, oh, Texas is under, under a glacier at the moment. And, uh, oh man, really yeah. what, Jason's still alive. Yeah. You know? And then right after that, Danko Jones calls and says, dude, <laughs> are you okay down there? And I just, you know, I was like, wow. Did you tell Danko you know, to come get his weather? Maybe. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Maybe, maybe for my sake, uh, it's just kind of like, um, uh, you know, terrible to think this way, but maybe we should, we should have cold snaps more often and make 
uh, my favorite rock stars uh, worry about me, so they call me. Well, and that'd be fine because then we'd be prepared for it. That's the thing with Texas. We're prepared for 100-degree days in the summer that stretch on for three and four months at a time where you're just melting on the sidewalk. But uh, we're the kind of – Austin, Texas goes into lockdown if we have as much as three-quarters of snow that doesn't stick to the ground. And I've been looking at snow now for for a week, which is totally unprecedented in my lifetime as a native Texan here in central Texas. There's other areas of the state, the state being as big as it is, that that get this worse than we do. But this is uh, this is crazy. This far south is weird. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's you know, it's rare, um, you know, when uh, when all of this kind of stuff happens, like, well, the first time it snowed this week, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was like powder. Exactly. And people yeah. were all, yay, snow, we, you know, yeah. yay. They all loved it and everybody was having a good time and all that. So a few days later, it snows again. <laughs> Actually, the difference in the snow was quite a lot. And yeah. I'm not a snow expert, but I will say this it was like the snow the other, you know, a week ago was, uh, it was pretty, but it was powdery. Yeah. No, we just we just had like yesterday was uh, was snowflakes. It was beautiful. It was yeah. this, different. It was pure. It w- reminded me more of what you know Christmas snow when you think of that type of stuff. You know, yeah, a story yeah. snow. And I was like, wow, that's that's incredible. But that was all, that was a such a short moment because I was so, I'm so over it. Yeah. Only because I was freezing <laughs> my nuts off. Yeah. And I haven't showered in a week because right. of the uh, other stuff that's bad about it, right? So Yeah. Well, today's the first day we've seen above freezing temperatures for the first time in a week. Um, so I think we're at the tail end of it, but uh, we're going to be a few days without water, at least here at my house. I'm starting to get pretty ripe. and uh, But I think Don't the worst get me started of it— on that. Yeah, yeah I'm hoping the worst of it is behind us, but it has been crazy. And uh, I want to also take a minute to thank all the people that reached out to me, uh, Frank Meyer, Johnny Martin, the guys from the River City Rebels. I got a few texts and uh, emails myself from people that live uh, out of state who were thinking, oh, my God, how is that poor guy surviving in Texas? His blood's too thin for this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's it's awesome that our some of our favorite folk have uh, reached out and checked on us. I want to say um, that there are a lot of heroes. There's a lot of assholes, but there's a lot of heroes in this too. And there's a lot of people that uh, have been, my neighbors have been great uh, yeah. checking on me and uh, the uh, going to help me like basically with repairs and stuff. Yeah. The, the other yeah. thing is, is there's a lot of people volunteering for Red Cross yeah. Um, Billy Chainsaw, uh, plays bass for a thousand bands, uh, in Igniter with me, he's in a band with my brother as well. Zero percent. Mm-hmm. My point is, uh, I believe that he's out all day today, uh, volunteering for the Red Cross. So people yeah. like that and people who are our family and friends who, you know, have the, the strength and the, and the will to drive around on ice and help elderly and stuff like that. There is a lot of that going on. So yeah, it's, there's a positive side to this and yeah. Yeah. So people pissed off and getting real political about how it was handled. Uh, yeah. Or by the people upstairs, so to speak. And right, I right. won't, I don't want to get into that. I don't want yeah, to I don't either. It. I don't want to get into it, but let's just um, say there's a lot of a lot of good people doing a lot of good things in a time of need. And uh, you and I and our producer Jared, we have electricity, so we're able to to tape a show today. So uh, we're gonna get on with rocking just like we normally do. We're just gonna look a little scruffy while we're doing it. So <laughs> uh, keep with- that to yourself. I look exactly <laughs> the same. In my opinion, I think you do too. <laughs> Today we are talking about underrated albums, and I'd like to uh, qualify that statement a little bit, if I may. Um, yes, please. I'm talking about. I'm not talking about underrated albums by bands that uh, 
are not I'm not taking anything away from them, but I'm looking at bands that are more or less household names, pretty well known, uh, have a pretty sizable audience, but they may have a record or two in their catalog that is often swept under the rug or dismissed or outright trashed by the fans, uh, even the bands themselves. And I think that's what we're talking about today. So I wanted to go into some of those albums, underrated albums by bands that are pretty well known that either deserve a second look or don't deserve all the criticism they've gotten over the years. And uh, with that, I'll start with you, Jason. What do you got on your list? I want to start off with, uh, you know, uh, a record that that I freaked out when I heard it for the first time. This record came out in 1996, and um, everybody remembers the band Jellyfish as a oh, band yeah. that could have, should have probably been the next cheap trick or power pop yeah yeah pop, pop rock band that coulda woulda shoulda the thing is is i, I don't want to the record i want to talk about is not by jellyfish it's the record that was made when they disband when they kind of went sort of jellyfish went belly up <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and some of the guys made uh, a, a new project called imperial drag Oh, right, right. Do you know that record? Do you recall that record? I know the band name, and I know that a lot of people hold that record up as sort of a, a bit of an underground classic. But... I would agree wholeheartedly, and I just, it's a sin that the record didn't didn't do as good as it coulda, shoulda, woulda, and this is pretty much a great example of a, of a part of what this show is about. Yeah. Uh, because it they weren't because they weren't like necessarily the household name, but I guarantee everyone's heard a jellyfish song that hit song on uh, summer movies and uh, ads and uh, you know they probably know it. The, I'm I don't want to talk about jellyfish. I want to talk about imperial drag. Right. It wasn't produced by anyone that I'm familiar with. A, a Brad Jones. Um, it was you know. I'll, I'll say it again, a spawn of jellyfish. Imperial yeah. drag to me sounded like, uh, you know, T-Rex and David Bowie with this modern production, but there's so much sort of 70s style synthesizer stuff going on. Yeah. And it has one of the greatest like rock singers of our time, and one Eric Dover. Dover. I was going to ask. He came over from Jellyfish, right? Yep. Yep. So he's, he's one of the. Okay. There's a couple of guys from Jellyfish, and then there were, were some other guys that I think they knew that uh, were related to Jellyfish, but actually weren't in Jellyfish. Uh, yeah. That's that's a whole. That's another show. And uh, Eric Eric went on sang with Slash Slash's Snake Pit on the first album, just for that, a little context that's, there that's correct, that's correct. He, but go ahead uh, tell us about imperial he drag also, he also worked with alice cooper i don't know to that's what extent right. but he did work with alice cooper that's right um, yeah i think he wrote i think he wrote songs with alice cooper and he may have performed some songs on a record later in the 90s maybe yeah. early 2000 or something yeah but yeah eric dover is a uh, is really really good and uh could have, should have stayed with Slash and been a household name like the guy Slash has now. Yeah. Uh, the uh, which, which oddly enough, I can't think of his name right now, and I'll get slapped for that later. <laughs> Miles um, Kennedy. That's that's correct. Thank you. So the singles were Zodiac Sign and Are You a Boy or a Girl? And yeah. Are You a Boy Boy or a Girl was is that's the song. It is such. A home run when you listen to it. It's it's sleaze rock, it's glam rock. It totally fit uh, that mid '90s alternative radio thing because yeah. of the ilk uh, and the groove and the the weirdness of the song. Yeah. Um, but it but it was not. When I say glam rock, I don't mean you know cock rock. I don't right. Mean, Poison or even Bon Jovi or, right. or 
bad kiss or uh, <laughs> when, when when you said tango or I don't mean that I mean right T Rex and David Bowie and stuff like that. When you when you mentioned them early on, and I I remember reading the reviews, and all the reviews in the magazines kind of classified them as sort of a throwback to what it, I would call it like garage glam. So it, it kind of had glammy influences, but the music was sounding not. It wasn't all that polished. It sounded like it was still coming out of the garage. I, I, dis I disagree. It was very very polished. Was it okay? I don't know the Fair, album, the, but the production is very polished and it's slick. It sounds so sweet. I mean, it sounds like a Cheap Trick record when okay. Cheap Trick got a got like that money producer. You know, yeah. not, not talking like the first Cheap Trick record, which was probably a little bit lower budget than, you know, I don't know, Heaven Tonight or something. Yeah, <laughs> you could count on that, yeah. So this is more <laughs> like Heaven Tonight kind of production where a lot there's a lot of vocals, it's all uh, harmonies everywhere, and I just I just thought it, it could have, should have gained a lot more momentum. And, right. And now I want to move on because the show theme that we have today is and should be more about household names. What do you got? Give yeah. us a big one that could have, should have. Um, well, my, the, the first one on my list is from a band that everyone knows, and that band is ACDC. And I've always thought that their flick of the switch album that I believe came out in 1983 was highly underrated. I still think it's one of their better albums. Um, it lives in the shadow, unfortunately, for its sake. It lives in the shadow of Back in Black and For Those About to Rock. So two gigantic, huge records. Um, so, of course, uh, if you're measuring it against that, um, it's 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 going to take a beating. Because, I mean, any record next to Back in Black is going to take a beating. But I always thought it kind of got dismissed as a disappointment and kind of brushed under the rug. Um, but I think as I want, far as I want to, I want to interrupt you. I want you to keep going, but I want to interrupt you and go, we're talking about flick of the switch, not fly on the wall. Flick of the switch. Right. Yeah. It, not fl you, you said it took a beating. It didn't take a beating as much as fly on the wall. That's that was the joke I was trying to convey there was, okay. Yeah. It is a killer record. It is not the 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 whipping dog that fly on the wall is right no so, i meant i meant by comparison following hot on the heels of back in black and then for those about to rock yeah i mean acdc put out some albums beyond flick of the switch that that took even bigger beatings but <laughs> yeah um, i think but we're uh, not talking about that we're talking about flick of the switch that just kicks ass right right and i i think it's a great record um uh i think it's probably the last great record they did with brian johnson at least for a while um it's probably the last record that i as a fan felt compelled to have in my collection as a must-have record uh, there was some spots here and there that came along afterward that uh, were were good, but I felt like um, as far as collecting the albums as an ACDC fan, that's kind of where I stopped was Flick of the Switch. And the songs on there are great. I mean, you've got the title track, you've got Bedlam in Belgium, Guns for Hire, Nervous Shakedown. There's some good quality stuff on that album. I just feel that everyone was waiting to measure it up against uh back in black and for those about to rock and and honestly for those about to rock was considered a bit of a disappointment because how the hell are you going to top back in black right how dare them how yeah effing dare them because yeah. the consistency is there and i'm agreeing with you uh flick of the switch was on my on my honorable mention list for the uh theme of this show yeah and i you know the only reason it's down there is so we wouldn't both have the same record on our list. Right, but right. I, I agree 100%. I think that your fly on the wall and your blow up your video and stuff like that were, were way down the totem pole. And um, I, I think that the rediscovery of Flick of the Switch for a lot of fans needs to happen. And it might have, it, it's the first record without Phil Rudd. Um, 
Phil is on the record. It's the first record that Mutt Lang didn't produce in a while. Oh, okay. All right. So the production is personnel. Yeah, the, the right. production is a little stripped down compared to the its two predecessors. And that may have had something to do with it as well. But to me, the songs are strong and I almost welcome the stripped down production. It almost kind of takes it back to almost a powerage sort of feel. But yeah. um but yeah, I mean, like I said, there's been albums that came along after Flick of the Switch that uh, that I don't feel are necessary to have, and they might get criticized, and I probably wouldn't argue the criticism. But I do think that Flick of the Switch is one that um, a lot of fans either gave up on or dismissed because of the critical reception, but um, I feel like it's a strong album and definitely worth revisiting if you haven't listened to it in a while. Super strong. Uh, just what gonna, else you got? I'm just going to refer here to, uh, you know, he, uh, Simon Wright is in the video for Flick of the Switch. Right. You're, you're saying he did <laughs> not play on the record. I don't believe he recorded the album. I think it's okay. the last one with Phil Rudd. But yeah, okay. Simon came on board right after it. So so you quickly. are correct. He's fly on the wall. Who made who blow up your video? Yeah, that's you that's correct. Simon but, right. But it's it's funny that it's Phil playing on the record on on a flick of the switch, and it's Simon and Simon on the, on the video. Yeah, that happens from time to time. But, yeah, that does happen. But that's yeah. okay. That's yeah. all right. It's happened to me. It can happen to you. Um, I, I've got I've got sort of one that might seem a little left field because you know, we, we not by choice, not for any reason, but we, we don't really hear it talk louder. We're not sticking to one type of music necessarily, but it's all going to be hard rock. Um, yeah. and not limited to, of course, is what I was about to say is, uh, progressive rock. Right. Now, everybody knows the band. Yes. And if you don't, you need to just pick up a book a history book about <laughs> any kind of music because yes is probably mentioned in there. Right. They've been around since, you know, probably the sixties, um, in some form or fashion. Yeah. Um, and they sort of wrote the book, uh, along with Genesis and others, uh, you know, for, you know, creating a Genesis of progressive rock and roll music. Yeah. Uh, incredible musicianship known for long epic uh songs that are busy and uh lyrically they're they're here you go they're hook challenged right yeah even yeah. though it's me there's hooks everywhere but uh my brain is probably working a different you pick slower yeah. or faster than somebody else's at any given moment. Different circuit uh, board. Right, right. So I'm hearing things <laughs> a little tinged and opinionated. The, uh, yeah, so they're no, you know, just to put it on a layman's term here, yes, is one of Rush, Rush's biggest influence. And um, along with Led Zeppelin and many other yeah. things. Share uh, a lot of similarities, Rush. yeah. Yeah. But the, you know, the nine minute song, the song with, you know, 10 different riffs or, or movements, uh, to, to use a classical term or, uh, you know, uh, Rush did that. Well, they got it from these guys, you know? Yeah. Um, so in 1983, which is, you know, two to three years after Rush's learning of straddling the line. It's like, okay, we're a prog rock, dare I say prog metal band, learning how to straddle the line and write a song that's going to be on the radio, like a lot more than Working Man or a lot more than Spirit Radio or whatever with moving pictures. You know, it was Tom yeah. Sawyer. But is there sort of like, you know, the beginning of that, right? Yeah. We figured it out. Yay. You know, the, that was yeah. Rush at the moment. Well, well yes, you know, like I said, two or three years later, finally, this prog rock band has a song that's charting. It's all over the place. They're not known for this, like, um, kimono rock anymore. They're this kind of, like, modern-sounding, you know, 
it was the, w- when they got uh, Trevor Rabin on guitar, mm-hmm. and uh, I think his name's Greg Howe, uh, stepped out for a moment. He came back a couple years later, but uh, Trevor Rabin came in, and um, he is this, you know, had more of a brain for something that those guys had, which was probably at least a little more uh, hook Latin, right? Yeah. He writes this song with these guys, uh, well, with Chris, the uh, the bass player, uh, and Chris Chris Squire. Yeah. And they wrote they wrote this uh, record nine zero one two five. Yeah, I with remember all of, all of the stuff. Yeah, you can't get it out of your head. Owner yeah. of a Lonely Heart. Okay, great so, song. Owner of a Lonely Heart. Yeah, great song. Movies and commercials, and it's it's literally all over the world right now, and in '83, and on MTV, and yeah. that was one of the first videos on MTV. I remember the video. I loved it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it has a module. Has a has a, a key modulation in the song. It has riffs. It has it has a lot of uh, shucking and jiving going on, yet danceable. Yeah. So this. You can you can tell that it's yes because of the players are all intact, right? Yeah. The work is is different, and because of the obvious, I've already said that. But the point that I'm making is, on the record, there's still moments of. I mean, it's yes, they're a prog rock band. Sure. But the record is polished. The record is not what the your typical yes fan is looking for when they go see yes when they buy a yes record therefore it was a bit trampled by their people yeah okay this gotcha. is what this theme of the show is about that yeah. record even though that had like a charting massive hit in owner of a lonely heart i feel like those hardcore prog rock fans who were just you know, tripping all the time on how crazy the music has to be for them to be into it. You know, people who liked Frank Zappa, like, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a thing there. There's a little yeah. bit of a crossover thing going on where it's not a, this, it's not really just all these, like, but it's not, there's no bubble gum involved. Yeah. Well, Lonely Heart had all this sweet harmony and it was just, right? It was a radio song. That's right. That's yeah. right. They figured out how to do that with this guy, Trevor Rabin, in the band. Yep. And it brought the band to a whole new level and garnered them many, many more fans, exactly like Metallica's The Black Album. Yep. Man, there's this new band, Metallica, and they got this inner Sandman. No, dude, they have like four <laughs> yeah. more albums. You're missing the boat. And this right. is really the real Metallica. In, that's a... That's that same fandom. parallel. That's a combination. That's a conversation that's happening between old Metallica fans and new Metallica fans that didn't know about the previous thrash metal roots, right? You could say that a thousand times when someone goes, man, there's this new band, Rush, and they got this song, Tom Sawyer. No, you need to hear 2112 and Hemispheres, bro. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they, man, I don't like their old stuff. This Tom Sawyer, you know, it's so... It's so 90125. It was kind of a curve curveball album. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I just I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and give the opinion that I think it's really a masterpiece and it's one of those records that took uh a band not known, you know, it, they did something different. Yeah. They 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 tried they bat left-handed and still hit another home run, but not with their fans. They got a whole new crop. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Good so call. What do, you, what do you got? Thanks. Um, again, I'm going to go, uh, this might not surprise people that know me because I'm a huge Aerosmith fan, but I always thought the Done With Mirrors album was a great album, and it got pretty much, it. It. I think it, the fans weren't too crazy about it at first, but I think it's one of those records they came back and learned to appreciate many, many years later. Um, it didn't do what the record label was hoping it would do in terms of sales. It didn't do what the label wanted it to do, but it's a solid record. It was an interesting time for Aerosmith because it was the first album with Joe Perry and Brad Whitford returning to the band. What year is that? Um, I want to say 83. 
83, 85, 85. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 85. Um, so they'd been not absent, but under the radar for a while. Uh, they'd been missing Joe Perry and Brad Whitford. Um, they come back with Joe Perry and Brad Whitford. They're now on Geffen Records, which at, in 1985 was probably the biggest label you could sign to. And it looked like all the ingredients were in place for Aerosmith to have this great big blockbuster comeback, and it didn't happen on that album. Um, but I don't think it's through any fault of the songs. I think the album is a great collection of songs. Um, they reworked the Joe Perry's Let the Music Do the Talking, and that was the single on that album. That was his song previous to being on the Aerosmith album. He recorded it with his own band, The Joe Perry Project, and it went nowhere. Um, but somebody saw the potential in it, and they reworked it a little bit, and Tyler might have changed some of the lyrics a little bit. But it was the single, and uh, it got some radio play, but then the album sank quickly. And with the backing of Geffen, I was kind of surprised that it sort of faded away as quickly as it did, because beyond the song Let the Music Do the Talking, that album has a song called My Fist, Your Face, which is a great song. There's a song on there called Sheila that's a great song. Um, it's just a it's a it's a better album than uh, than it gets credit for, in my opinion. And I think hardcore Aerosmith fans uh, would probably agree because they've taken the time to absorb it and study it and appreciate it for what it is. But commercially speaking, it didn't do what the label and the band had hoped for. Uh, little did they know that right around the corner was permanent vacation and that would just send them into a whole new career. But that album done with mirrors is kind of the the lost puppy in between the classic Aerosmith catalog and what would become the second wave of the Aerosmith blockbuster catalog. It's a great album, Done With Mirrors, 1985. I saw that tour, and uh, the band was still kind of a mess. They were still fighting their demons or whatever, but uh, the album, as far as the studio record, I thought it was great, Done With Mirrors. What's another, uh, do you have some more song titles from that record? Uh, there's Sheila, My Fist, Your Face, Let the Music Do the Talking. There's a song called The Darkness. There's a song called The Hop. Uh, I have the record, but yeah. I haven't spun it in a long time. Yeah, and now you've put me on the spot, and I'm I'm trying to think. No, I can't, it's okay. You, I can't you, rattle them off. You you covered all all of the the ones I could call my faves off of that. Uh, there's a song called "The Reason a Dog." That's a good one, also. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it's. I mean, I don't know how many songs are on it total, but let's say there's Jeez. nine or ten, and I think there are most of them. There's more keepers than fillers. I don't. I don't know records if there is were, a filler. Records were short. Records, yeah, long time records were real short. I, it was, it was later uh, late nineties that I think a lot of people were. It was it was with the digital age because on yeah, phone, you can only do like twenty two minutes aside on a record. So and the and those guys were probably coming back with a limited amount of material. They had just reunited. I mean, they had to rework a Joe Perry project song for their single, so they were probably short on material to begin with. You know. But um, I think as a studio recording, it's pretty solid. So yeah, I like I'm gonna it. go. I'm gonna go with Done with Mirrors. I'd I'd also you know I'd also throw in Rock in a Hard Place, but I don't want to prolong the the Aerosmith uh, the Aerosmith sales pitch here. But that's oh, another God, one. Why not? I could uh, I could talk about Aerosmith for about three days. Yeah, but that's uh, another oh, one that gets. On- on my uh, yeah, rock in a hard place is is awesome. My uh, my band uh, at uh, you help you were involved in the uh, the, cho- oh, the choosing yeah. of uh, lightning uh, strikes of lightning strikes and uh, broken teeth covering that. Yeah, great uh, I'm cover. Actually, actually, doing that song with my adult program at work at the School of Rock. Awesome we're, we're a version of that. Uh, we're That's... actually doing a show Aerosmith versus Cheap Trick, and there's some deep cut deep deep cuts. We're doing. Nice. Uh, uh, I want to know why we're doing that one. Aerosmith. Good. Yeah. Good yeah. One. So yeah, I want to mention real quick, get your wings, which is oh. like 74, which is like, you know, 10, Great year, album. 10 years earlier. And Great that album. was considered a ball drop. 
by the label. Yeah. By, you know what I mean? It was a sleeper. And like we've been saying, the records were short. They were, they were like a one, two punch. They were putting out two records a year because they kind of had to, yeah. but I mean, dude, that record has same old song and dance Lord yep. of the Eyes and seasons of wither on it. Yep. Yep. Was uh, brought to, we were talking earlier and it was brought to my attention from you that dream on was on the first record and was a sleeper hit. Related yeah. to that is the third record by Kiss has Kiss's Rock and Roll All Night on it, which was the hit, I think, after the live album came out, Kiss Alive. Right. And now when I'm in the grocery store and I hear Rock and Roll All Night, guess what version they're playing? The, the live, live one. Version. I hear Always. the live version. So it's just really strange that they, uh, whoever they are, choose yeah. the live version of, of rock and roll all night it's very interesting uh little like huh like why yeah. would that kind of thing um anyway um not i've got one uh, this is gonna this is gonna uh well it needs to be it needs to be pointed out that dream on was indeed on the very first aerosmith yeah. album but it wasn't a hit at that time. Until? It, it wasn't a, a hit until it was re-released as a single later on after the band started to develop some momentum. And then everybody goes, hey, have you heard the new Aerosmith song, Dream On? It's climbing the charts. It's an awesome song. It's all over the radio. And it's like, dude, that came out on their first album, but nobody paid attention to it at the time. Someone was, yeah, someone was finally investing in them since they had a hit or two with Sweet Emotion and, and uh, uh, Walk This Way. Yeah, I and, think it became and, a hit on a on a greatest hits repackaging or something like that. Sure. Or else it was re-released as a single at some point after the fact, but it was not a hit when it was released on the first album. Well, I'm trying to say that that the band didn't really have a footprint until uh Toys in the Attic. Yeah. So when True. that happened and they had those two massive hits with Sweet Emotion and Walk This Way. Yeah. That's when Dream On was starting to hit. They were going, yeah. "Whoa, it's like rediscovery." Which yeah. is which is what a lot of this is is uh, there's common denominators in what we're talking about in all of this. Yeah, People are discovering the old, your old material from the pop song that is on a record that probably could have done even more, but was dis was uh, was gutted by the the true fans by the original fans because it was different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so my turn. I'm gonna jump. Yeah, in. go for it. In 1994. Motley Crue puts out a record with uh, a different singer. <laughs> and, oh, boy. Yeah. And a lot of people uh, don't like this record. It was a, a self-titled record. It was yep. the middle of the 90s when really nobody had any business putting out any kind of cock rock music whatsoever. <laughs> but if that's what yeah. your MO is, that's you don't disband, you don't give up, you don't stop, you don't buy a new wardrobe you are who you are if not you're just wearing a costume and you're fake yeah that's what i think yeah so <clears throat> so you know following the dollar bill is something that you know some people have to do sometimes um everybody is guilty of that once in a while molly crew gets a different singer yeah they're it's still um, the good thing about the the guy that replaced Vince Neil, John Karabi, is is he is a master singer. Yep. He's very very influenced by Steven Tyler. We were just talking about Aerosmith. Yeah. He's from Philadelphia. He's friends with all the Cinderella guys. He's a master songwriter. He lives in Nashville now, and he is one of the nicest guys in the world to boot. Yeah. Which I don't hear any of these things about Vince Neil. Songwriter, <laughs> I don't know any songs that Vince Neil has written because dudes in Motley Crue, you know, Tommy and Nikki and Mick, they yeah. write their yeah. songs. They yeah. write the lyrics. They write the songs. Okay. Well, let's go back to Karabi. He's a songwriter. Yeah. So he was in there with those guys going, check this out. And they're going, whoa, finally a songwriter. So I thought that that needed to be brought up. And I'm honestly, I'm still not technically dissing Vince Neil and what he means to Motley Crue fans, to the sound of the band, sure. and all of that needs to be championed and right. understood. That that's I'm not dog. I'm not here to dog out Vince Neil. I'm here to say, 
this Motley Crue record in 94 with a different singer who's got black hair and he's, he's not Vince Neil. He's the other side of Vince Neil. He can really sing. Yeah. <laughs> There's kind of a dog on Vince, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> he can really sing. He's got a proper, uh, you know, he's got proper tone. Um, it's darker, you know, it's grittier. He's a, yeah. he's a rock singer, right? He's a yeah. rock singer. And, um, you know, the, the songs that were, are sort of like, uh, that floated to the top on the record. I'll just say real quick. The first one that, that comes to my mind when I think of the record is hooligans holiday. Yeah. Uh, and then misunderstood, uh, and then, uh, power to the music and poison apples. Those are worth mentioning on that record. I'm going to ask you your opinion here in a second, but I just want to <laughs> like give it a, a little bit of wings here. Right. Um, you know, the, they, they, Motley Crue fans like were really upset. Um, yeah, they love Vince so much, and yeah. I think that that's awesome. That fans uh, feel like they were ripped off or something, you know, by they were someone kicked them in the pants, you know, yeah, someone beat them up or something by by making a new record. Who is this guy? You know, it's like, what are you gonna do? Go to the Motley Crue show with, when they tour with uh karabi and like throw tomatoes no <laughs> you're not going to do that you know but do you you know i think that it's hard for you to hear is it a ripper owens thing when you go see judas priest and you see ripper owens yeah. sing halford's play halford's part kind of a thing yeah i think it is i think it's exactly like that um yeah you know karabi could have been in our replacement singers episode just like so many other people could have been in that uh, yeah. a part two of that if we wanted to anyway yeah. um, I just really think that this record was strong and it could have been the greatest moment in the history of Motley Crue and no one would ever like I would be shot at if I was in public saying that in public address because <laughs> I don't know I about think, that. Well, I don't. I think, I think a lot of people agree with you. I think a lot of really? people think that's Motley Crue's best album. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. I. Yeah. I. I want to say I'm not that one I'm, of them, but right. <laughs> but you're right. not alone at all. But not by a long shot. Okay. Good. That's fair. And I know that you, you know, when when a Motley Crue fan walks into the room, and you're listening to this Karabi Crew record. Um, how do they react? I'm sure a lot of them don't realize it's Motley Crue. I mean, the, the hardcore fans will, the, the hardcore fans will start going crazy because they can't believe they're hearing their favorite crew album out in public because it doesn't get the kind of recognition. That's one of those albums they all secretly love at home, but it never got played on the radio. So no, the masses weren't, uh, exposed to it or at least not long enough for, for it to sink in. So one half of the room doesn't even realize it's Motley Crue. The other half of the room is excited because they can't believe it's being played in public. So they're <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I'm one of the, I'm a, I'm a big Motley Crue fan. Surprise, surprise. But I'm in the, uh, I'm in the, I get, I get beat up by my friends over this all the time. Uh, I'm one of those guys that just doesn't get that record. I've tried and tried and tried to listen to it and force myself to like it, and I just don't hear it. And I've got nothing but crazy respect for John Karabi. He's 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 all the amazing things that you just that you just said. And on paper, it seems like that would really work. And maybe I just had a hard time, like a lot of fans, just accepting that it was Motley. And I'm. I would even be okay with them having a different singer. I think it's because they shifted gears and got a little darker and a little maybe grungier or whatever. It wasn't musically what I wanted from Motley Crue. But then again, Motley Crue wasn't giving me what I wanted from them musically since Shout at the Devil. So um, I know a lot of people that love that album. A lot of people say it's the best thing Motley Crue's ever done. I'm not in that camp, but I respect those opinions. I respect John Karabi. I respect what the band was trying to do at that time. 
and I've, I've, trust me, I've tried. I've wanted to like this album so bad, especially when I hear all the praise it gets from people I respect and from friends, friends of mine. But it just never grew on me, and I, I, I just can't put my finger on quite why. But um, it, I don't. I think I it's own okay, it, but Dave. I never listen to it. Dave, so. it's okay. <laughs> it's all right, Dave. You don't. Thanks. You don't, thanks. I feel we're, better. We're, now. we're not going to tie you down and make you listen. <laughs> so, so I have publicly come out and said that I am not really a Motley Crue fan. Yeah. Um, I think that I have uh, Too Fast for Love in my collection and probably Shout at the Devil and then I have this Karabi one. Okay, That's it. Yeah. Uh, that really doesn't make me a, a, a real Motley Crue fan, so to speak, right? Because I only have a couple of things, right? Yeah. I dabble yeah. in Motley Crue, right? right? Here's the deal. I bought the first Motley Crue record, Too Fast for Love, on Leather Records before yeah. they were signed. They, you know, it was limited. They, you know, they were on a, they just put it out themselves and got some distribution pretty much. Yep. And um, I bought it at Waterloo Records here in Austin, Texas in 1980, what was that, 81? Yeah, 82. somewhere between 81 and 83. Yeah. It's somewhere yeah. in there. 81, yeah. 81, I think it was. 80, Maybe 82. No, it would have been 82. 82. Yeah, I think and Shout was 83. So it's 80, right. Yeah. It was 82. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, and I freaked out because the album cover, the the attitude, the what they were doing, it was like Kiss. You know, it was, it was yeah. like that whole, like, uh, over-the-top thing they were doing. Their hair looked like it was airbrushed on. You know, it yeah. just looked real. It was really creepy looking. In Vince's case, it I, was. And then I heard the record, <laughs> and I was like, this is crazy. These dudes are crazy. It, it was all raw. It's all recorded like punk rock or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, they tried to polish it as best they could, but... It was pretty gnarly. Like the guitar tones were kind of bedroom tone, what it's I call great. bedroom tone. It's you know, great. Just nasal. Nah, 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 nah. It was, <laughs> yeah. It was really wild sounding and like, you know, not like your the Scorpions guitar tone or something. No, right? no, no. It was no. raw and and it sounded angry to me. Yep. And I uh, I bought the record and ran home and told all my friends about it. A year later, they were everyone else's favorite band, and I wrote them off. Yeah. <laughs> they wasn't yeah. my secret anymore. <laughs> so I kind of messed yeah. that up for myself. But anyway, um, yeah, so Motley Crue's 94 self-titled, I think, is a great underrated uh, record that that needed to be uh, like hung on the wall and looked at for a moment and sort of rediscovered by myself and, and many and, and get your opinion. So thank you for playing along. Oh yeah. You know, that might've been painful for you. You know, no, no, not at all. I, I totally respect, like I said, what they were trying to do. It just didn't work for me, but you are not alone by a long shot in, in loving that album and appreciating it. So yeah. Well, it didn't uh, sell and that makes it, part of our stringer of yeah. records here that we're talking about because yeah. it didn't move like the way theater pain or whatever, right. Didn't move right. in, uh, in, in, uh, in the, pe the people that, that paid for the studio sessions, uh, that year, uh, they didn't, they didn't get their money back. So, to speak. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean? yeah. Um, I'm going to go with another household name. Um, and an album in his catalog that I think gets overlooked uh, to a degree, at least compared to some of the others in that same catalog. I'm going with Alice Cooper's From the Inside. Wow. And yeah, that is, uh, that came out in when? 78, I think. And it's sort of a, it's a bit of an odd album because it's a concept album. And um, he basically it was inspired by his stay in, a, in an asylum where he was being treated for, I believe, you know, alcoholism and drugs or whatever. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, so he turned that experience into this album from the inside. And it's, uh, it's a really good album. Um, Bernie Taupin, who that is a name that I'm sure rings loud and clear with you. Yeah, um, that's we could do a whole show on him. And my, yeah, Elton John's uh, but, lyricist. But then I don't, I don't think I would partner. let you talk. I don't. I yeah. totally wouldn't let you talk. So <laughs> yeah, right. I wouldn't get a word Sorry, in on Bernie that talk. one. Yeah, but uh, from the inside uh, is a '78 Alice Cooper concept album. He paired up with Bernie Taupin. Uh, Dick Wagner is. Uh, one of the guitar players on there, the other guitar players from Elton John's band, the bass players from Elton John's band. Um, That's Dee Murray and Davy Johnstone. D- there you D- go. Murray on bass and Davy Johnstone on There guitar. you go. And uh, there's a guest appearance by a guitarist that uh, you'll know. Um, we've talked about this band numerous times. Do you know who the, who the guest guitar player is? I think he only plays on one song. On From the Inside? Yeah. I don't. Rick Nielsen. Oh, cheap trick. Yeah, cheap trick. Right. He's uh, he's on one of the songs on that album. And uh, the hit on that album was uh, a ballad called How You Gonna See Me Now. Yes. And it's a it's really... The title of a film, I think. It's a great Alice Cooper song. Uh, Bernie Taupin had a hand in it. And, you know, Alice always did great ballads. You know, he's... He's known as, you know, for all of his shock rock and outrageousness and his fast and loose songs and that sort of thing. But when he hunkers down to do a ballad, man, he could really break your heart. And that that song does it. How are you going to see me now? And also on that album is a song called Seriously or Serious. It's called Serious. And I think I think that might be the song Rick Nielsen plays on. Um there's a dedication. Here's another piece of trivia along the lines of the Rick Nielsen thing. If you open up the album, so the album cover is split down the middle, so it opens like two doors. And then when you th- within that, there's another little door called the Quiet Room, which is the name of one of the songs on the album. And if you open that door, there's a picture of Alice all curled up in like a padded room, and there's a message on the inside of the door and it references somebody named Mooney. Do you know who that is? No. It's Alice's old drinking buddy, Keith Moon from the who. Oh, the drummer from the who. Oh yeah. So there's a little dead, hidden dedication in there to, uh, Keith Moon from the who. And, uh, so it's a great album, a lot of good songs. How are you going to see me now? Serious, Wish I Was Born in Beverly Hills, uh, For Veronica's Sake. Uh, Jackknife Johnny is a great song. Um, our friend Sean Weingartner loves this album, and uh, and I do too. So great album. He, I actually he just, got— He just texted me right now to check on me and see if I'm under a glacier. <laughs> so— <laughs> <laughs> I said, nope, we're, we're yeah. doing great. Tell, so, you tell them yeah. you're on top of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah right. But yeah, I'm going to go with Alice Cooper from the inside. And uh, much like the Aerosmith, I've got an Alice Cooper honorable mention. I'm going to go with Special Forces, which was kind of considered oh, one of God. his new wave albums. So but, glad uh, you brought that up. Yeah, it was like heavy metal Devo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was this weird, dark, twisted kind of new wave sort of thing. Alice changed his look at that time. And uh, in hindsight, he calls that period of his career the blackout years or something like that because he was he was pretty he was wasted fu- during that time. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he and he doesn't remember doing the, a lot of those those two or three albums during that time frame that he doesn't even remember doing. But if he did that album wasted out of his mind, he he did pretty well because uh, Special Forces is a almost completely forgotten Alice Cooper record. Is there a least, song in there called "Don't Talk to Me" or something like that? Uh, the ones I remember is "Prettiest Cop on the Block." Uh, who I'm do we the prettiest th- cop on the yeah. block? Yeah, who, who do you think we are? Um, yeah, that, isn't that a cover song? No, oh, there's a song called Seven and Seven Is, which is a cover song on that album. That's I, right. I, I, is it uh, I Alvin love, Lee or love, love? It's that love. garage band Love that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's a great yeah. version. His version yeah. is very good. 
uh, uh, there's a song on there called "You Look Good in Rags" that I love. You look good in rags. Yeah, the lyrics yeah. are great. Yeah. Yeah, the whole record is really, really. Strong. Yeah, I, I might, I, I probably should have picked that one over from the inside, but uh, I had them both on my list, neck and neck, and I didn't want to mention one without the other. So, real quick, wanted to totally, throw in special. Totally, forces. totally fair. Uh, I just so you know, Special Forces is my favorite, like, oddity. Uh, Alice record. It's not. Yeah. It's the fashion. It's not from the inside because a lot of people like those records, and mine is that one and maybe Dada, which is right yeah. around the same time. Yeah, yeah. Those are the blackout years. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But I, I, I like Special Forces. I have it on vinyl, and I still go back to it every now and well, then. Well, and so. Aerosmith had blackout years, and those are my favorite Aerosmith. Exactly records. right. So what are you gonna do? It's what else you got? How about one more a piece? Um, you know, I had some, uh, had a couple of things here. Um, real quick, let's talk about Kiss the Elder. I think that, ah. um, just real quick, because no, that totally fits the theme of the song. Or the they show, were, yeah. they were, uh, you, you know, they, you know, Ace, Ace is in, Ace is out, Ace is in, Ace is out. We don't know. <laughs> I think yeah. they performed some of those songs as a three piece with just Paul Jean and Eric Carr. Yeah. That, that record has their, what kiss would, would call prog rock. You know, it's like their version of trying to be concept uh, album. Yeah. Have a little bit of a different, uh, you know, like thunder about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that the, some of the songs might've had a, a little bit more of a, they're not technical, you know, but they're trying to be a little brainier yeah. than below the belt buckle. Right, right. right. More brain and less uh, snake, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you think you, you think um you know let's see some honorable mentions are the obvious uh, a world without heroes, right? Yeah. That, that record, yep. That, that is I, yes. Song I I rocks. That song's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. And that sounds like Kiss to me. Yeah, that's it's the one lot. song on that album that does stand out as like a traditional Kiss song to me. I, I, I want to point out that uh, X-Ray Eyes from Dynasty, yeah, I has a has a melody line in it that's direct. Just, I mean, you can steal from yourself, I guess, but yeah, I has a melody in it. The la da 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 da. da. Da, 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 I don't know the words, but <laughs> yeah. X-ray eyes. Uh, uh, oh man, I'm it, evil it, man as a bride. It's like X-ray eyes has that same. It might be in the same key. Yeah, I yeah. thought that'd be interesting about I. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Very good overall as a record. I I I dog it. It's not my go-to. It's not uh, record, but I'm a huge Kiss fan, and I've never owned it. And I, I probably need to at least pick it up in the bargain bin and listen to it for nostalgia's sake, because I might find myself having uh, some sort of I, new appreciation for it. I know there are people out there that, much like you know the self-titled Motley record from '94, that will take the Elder over many other Kiss records that I hold dear to my heart. So it's just yeah. another one of those things that you don't know what, but it, since it didn't have, um, you know, I was made for loving you or lick it up, or it didn't have a thing, a, a, a flavor like that. It's yeah. a, it's a whipping dog for kiss. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have any, uh, the hooks on it are, are different than hooks prior and immediately after. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the elder that definitely fits the theme of the of the show. Um, well, you got one. I got one more. Uh, I actually, yeah. I got a couple more, but we might save them for another episode. But I don't want to leave this episode without bringing up uh, the Cult. They did an album called Beyond Good and Evil that came out in two thousand one, and I thought that was a great, great record. And it just died. The it was dead on arrival. It got no push. They released one single. It was a song called Rise. And when I heard it, I thought, man, the guitar sound on that song and the stomp in that song. The first time I heard it, I was like, this is as heavy as a Pantera song. I couldn't believe it was the cult. It just had balls for days. And it was just this stomp and rock and 
kick-ass song. And I listened to the whole album and I loved it. It was one of these things and it might just be personal to me, but it kept me company on road trips back and forth to Houston when I was going to see my girlfriend, who is now my wife. So I spent a lot of time with that record. And, I, and at the time I knew their, um, I knew the band's tour manager. So he hooked us up two or three times on that tour. So we actually saw the band multiple times during that time period of their career. And that album just kind of became a soundtrack to about a two year span of my life. And, uh, so that's kind of, you know, I, I'm personally invested in it, but even if I wasn't, and I was a cult fan or just a hard rock fan in general, I would be interested in that album, but I would have never heard about it because it was just dead on arrival. And it's a shame because it's really strong. I think overall the cult probably should have been a bigger band. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, they, 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 they had their day in the sun and yeah. then, and then it kind of like shaved down a little bit after that. But I just feel like even electric and sonic temple, you know, the, just the, the second half of the eighties for those guys should have put them in a, in a, in, in a constant, uh, you know, upper echelon. And it didn't, it didn't, right. I felt like it shaved down. Like I said, it, they it downsized just one notch and that's kind of where they remain. Right. And so the records that they will make, from here on out, we'll probably pale you know in what comparison. I mean? like they're not, yeah, yeah. It's not. I, I want them to be taken serious, and uh, it may or may not happen. But yeah, which is so, what I'm talking about with Beyond yeah. Good and Evil. It's like yeah. it, it, it came out after the band was kind of. Uh, Billy Duffy had left the band. The band was kind of in disarray for a number of years leading up See, to I that didn't album. Know that. I mean, Billy so, Duffy not in the cult doesn't sound like the cult. Yeah. So, so basically the public had a, had time to forget about them. And then by the time they were back, uh, nobody was notified that they're back <laughs> or nobody cared. And that's where that album landed. And it's too bad that it fell on deaf ears because it's a really strong album. It's one of my favorite cult albums. So for what it's worth. Um, we should save some of these for another episode. Uh, good topic though today. You brought up some good stuff and uh, I always like, I might even have to go revisit some of these things, especially the elder and uh, maybe, maybe uh, Imperial drag. I, I might yeah, need to dig into Imperial that. Drag and, and, uh, and find that, that yes album. 90125. Yeah. It's very good. All right. Good suggestions, Jason. All right, let's uh, move on to our shot of rock. I'm going to have a little fun and put you on the spot, and uh, the audience is going to thank me later, I think. Okay. I'm, I want to know, you're a, you're a, obviously a hard rock and a metal dude and a thrash dude and all that stuff, but what is your favorite power ballad? Um, there's a ton of them. Uh, I love UFO. I've always liked the way UFO uh, wrote power ballads. Yeah. Um, I think the Scorpions, right, which are relative uh, to the UFO. It's like the same camp almost, right? Yeah. The way that they write uh, power ballads, only in the by way of Michael Schenker. Um, the, you know, I, I can't really... The Scorpions, I can think of like two or three off the top of my head. Almost uh, always somewhere. Love that song. Holiday. Love it. Uh, you know, God, even further, I go further d up the tree a little bit with Still Loving You. Yeah. Uh, it's it's huge. It goes yeah. and goes and goes and goes. Uh, so I I I don't know, but you know, there's a uh, I Ain't No Baby by UFO. I'd probably, I'd probably throw in there. Um, somebody that we talked about, uh, on a past episode, um, the April wine song, just between you and Ooh, me. Yeah. That's so a good, good. one. That's seventies, man. That's like, you know, that's so good. They were power ballad before, you know, white snake. Yeah. That's yeah. a good one. That's a great song. It's a very, very good song. They sing a little bit of it in French too. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So, uh, anyway, I just 
I'm a sucker for a good power ballad, but it has to be have this certain uh, way about it. Yeah. Like, like okay, Brian Adams power ballad. Okay, sure. Yeah. Not, and it's probably fantastic. Uh, Love hurts. The uh, the Nazareth version of Love hurts. Yeah. Is a is a tearjerker. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of. Um, you know, I would even call there's some old like outlaw country guys that wrote tearjerker sort of lonesome cowboy that is the genesis of what I think ended up being, you know, stealing the title uh, or it gets all the all the thunder is uh, like old those old, old country, you know, guys writing these, you know, my woman left me kind of songs. Yeah. That's where I feel like the metal dudes writing a power ballad really got it from. Yeah, yeah. He's growing up with their grandpas and their dads listening to old outlaw country on the stereo or the AM radio. Yeah, I can I hear really that. Do think, and yeah. so I know, I know that that's part of it. I mean, Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, that's Willie Nelson, and it definitely is, a, you know, but it has the, the, you know, Happy Trails vibe to it. Yeah, but I'm telling you, if you pull that back and croon it even more, and put some heavy guitars on it, that could turn into something. Yeah. But it all turns into one thing. Um, but it, you know, I mentioned White Snake, another great band that can do a good power ballad. But I, I think if to... if your singer's got a good voice, because uh, one of the things with power ballads is the vocals has to be very convincing, and that's dependent on having a singer that can really not necessarily be a technically great singer, but a singer that can emote really well. And yeah. all the bands that you just mentioned have great singers. So, Well, that's kind of the thing. You don't, if you're not a great singer, you ain't got no power ballad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's all there is to it. <laughs> you have to be able to bring it. And, and, and the, uh, the colors that you, that you mentioned, you know, you have to be able to emote, you have to be able to, to have a, a this, sensitive side and you have to yeah. be able to do this thing that's called like fry vocal where you're it's almost like the less air you use you're making your voice crack before you know like you're using less air and then the more air you use it cleans your voice out yeah that is a technique that's used in power ballads by male singers well and female singers too um it's it almost sounds like a breath like a cracked a controlled crack in your voice yeah and i think that power ballads need to have that um but i'm going back to you know the obsession album by uh ufo uh looking out for number one has like all these strings and orchestral parts on it and stuff and and that's that's not a power ballad doesn't necessarily have to have that but in UFO's case, it was probably something that when they did live, it was a synthesizer. It wasn't an orchestra. Yeah. But uh, those, are, those are great power ballads by UFO, uh, the Scorpions, many others I mentioned as well. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. Good answers. Good. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of, uh, what do you think of album covers that, you know, this is my shot of rock. I, I'll admit it's it's sort of just off the cuff here. What Go do you think it. of album covers that are that were originally banned, or like they they come out and they do okay, and, they, and then they they become domestically released, and somebody somewhere and uh, you know the law comes out and they go that's inappropriate and we can't. What do you what's your opinion on that? Yeah, you asked me a similar question once before, and you were asking if I had any in my collection. And, oh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but this is this question's a little different. You're asking me my thoughts on the 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 need or the pressure to alter the artwork, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, I mean, what what can I say? I I I, I do appreciate the fact that. The original artwork always seems to have more of the band's stamp of approval. And then the label or the retailer comes along and says, we can't sell that in our stores with that image on the cover. And uh, so then they change it. Um, so 
to sort of answer your question, I kind of am going to go with uh, preferring the original album cover because I feel like it's what the band wanted. And it's a piece of art, and the music is the band's art, and they want to package it in a certain way. So I'm going to always side with the band when it comes to something like that. Not to say that some of the alternate covers that have become more popular or widely more widely known were bad. Um, some of them actually have been pretty cool. Like the Scorpions Love Drive album is the one that that comes to mind. Uh, the original artwork had the guy in the back seat with that woman, and there's bubble gum sort of stuck to her breast, and he's stretching it. And see, that's cheeky and cute and funny. Yeah, they're but laugh, you're having but, a laugh about it. And yeah, but then it got it got hammered by retail and the label, and they said we can't put that in our stores. So they ended up with just a cover of the scor a, a scorpion on the front. And I always thought that that alternate cover of Love Drive was was pretty cool you know no so, it's a it's a take it's a new take on their logo I, I i you hadn't seen prior to that and if if i don't recall correctly yeah it was it was yeah you're you might be right it, it was it was one of the first times you saw that sort of digital and at that time it was so whoa futuristic looking you know but, but i always like this but the, it's a painting but yeah the i'm talking about it's the first time you'd seen the scorpions that was in being encompassed or or drawn into uh, the, the, an actual into scorpion the into, into the, the artwork. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's a big blue scorpion. Yeah, I always love uh, the. I yeah. love the simplicity of it. I love the colors of it. I like the shading in the scorpion itself. And uh, so that was a case where the band had to sort of crater to outside pressure with regard to the artwork. And I thought what they came up with as a, as a plan B was pretty cool. But to answer your question, I'm always going to side with the band and I'm always going to vote for the original artwork because I firmly believe that's what the band wanted the album to look like. Yeah, it's kind of funny that... Uh... Not always, but a lot of times the band has absolutely nothing to do even with the original album yeah, art, yeah. Art release. I think it depends. Much, much, on, much on, less the, the alternate. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very aware of that. I I have friends and bands that tell me, well, the I don't know where the, where the cover came from. Somebody in the graphics department came up with it, and we just, you know, the label said, here's your album cover, and we said, right. okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think so, if you go back in, the, the further you go back, though, I think is where you find that the band maybe had more say. Um, I think some of the album covers in the 70s or whatever, I I, I feel like the band either didn't come up with it but had some final approval over it, and as time went on, they got more and more removed from that decision-making process overall. But yeah, but I'll always favor the artist and the band and what I think was their uh, initial intent with regards to their album cover. I think uh, I think the bigger the band gets, the less they have to do with the art. Yeah, the yeah. Or else, or, or or else the other is so is true. They get so big that they have absolute control over it and, and they just tell the label to shove it, you know, this thing's gonna sell ten million copies out of the box and we all know it. So you're either gonna you're either gonna do it my way or I'm not releasing the tapes and you can sue me if you want. <laughs> yeah, it's it's controlled yeah. some it's yeah. controlled somewhat by the by the the bigger you get. Sure. Yeah. But there's yeah. a lot of big bands that are too busy to be worrying about what's going on the album. Oh, cover. for sure. For sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good episode, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to uh, go boil some more snow because I'm thirsty and I need another need another drink of water. See, Gross. my tongue is starting to stick to the roof of my mouth. But yeah. Uh, I hope you make it through the rest of this snow apocalypse and uh, you're safe out there on the ice and uh, hopefully your power stays on and your pipes don't burst. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope the same is true here at my house as we start to thaw out. Uh, on behalf of myself, Metal Dave, my co-host Jason McMaster, thank you all for listening to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. 